Lord, we thank you for your holy word and we pray that you will speak to us through it as we think about it this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Dylan Alcott, the 2022 Australian of the Year, said, Be yourself and watch your world change. It's the easiest thing in the world to do. You've got to believe me, mate. It changes your life. Be yourself. And Taylor Swift, accepting her honorary doctorate in fine arts from New York University for being one of the most prolific and celebrated artists of her generation, said, we are many things all the time. And I know it can be overwhelming figuring out who to be. I have some good news. It's totally up to you. I also have some terrifying news. It's totally up to you. Who am I? How do I know who I am? I found, when I looked on the internet, 15,000 million posts in answer to this question, who am I? And then I looked at other popular advice, be yourself, 9,000 million. Even WikiHow, which is useful for learning how to do all sorts of things, from renewing lampshades to avoiding procrastination, can tell you how to be yourself. Knowing who you are and being true to yourself have never been more important than in the West in the 21st century. They're said to be signs of good mental health and well-being, the keys to authentic living and happiness. Many people believe that the most important place to look, to find yourself, is to look inward. Personal identity is a do-it-yourself project. Brian Rosner, the principal of Ridley College in Melbourne, wrote a book which was shortlisted for the um, Australian Christian Literature uh, Book of the Year Award last year. The book is called How to Find Yourself. Why looking inward is not the answer. And what he says is pertinent to this morning's readings. How to find yourself. Why looking inward is not the answer. Looking inward is important. Understanding what's going on inside us, or a say, or examining our motives, or thinking. Authenticity is also a good thing. It's important to be confident in your own identity, to feel comfortable with who you are, to be real. But expressive individualism, which is the technical term, the belief that looking inward is the way to find yourself, has become the primary approach to identity formation and, quest and questioning anybody's self-made self or self-identification is often considered an unfair attack on them. Of course, there's nothing wrong with looking inward. We do that each week when we come to confession. But our personal identity, who I am, is formed not primarily from looking inward. Personal identity, according to Brian Rosner, is formed by three things. Looking outward to our relationships, looking backwards and forwards to our stories, to our life stories, and looking upwards to God. And our readings today remind us of where our true identity is found. Our Old Testament and Gospel readings focus on people. Who are they? Think of the boy Samuel. Who is he? We don't know a lot about Samuel's inner life. His identity is formed, is defined by looking outwards to his relationships. A much loved, long awaited child conceived in answer to prayer. Entrusted to the old priest Eli, he grows up serving the Lord in the sanctuary at Shiloh. His devotion to the Lord in strong contrast to Eli's sons. He grows up in favour with God and the people and is recognised by people as one through whom God is speaking at a critical time in their history. We look backwards 
and realise that Samuel's story began long before we meet him in our short reading. He is part of a much bigger story in which God is working to rescue the world that's gone wrong. And we also look forwards as Samuel will go on to become a leader of God's people, serving them in a time of crisis leading up to the establishment of the monarchy. And we look up to God, the God who's given Samuel to his parents and who unexpectedly and surprisingly calls him by name and gives him work to do. To the God who changes his life, who enlists him into service for the good of God's people and who sustains him all the way to old age. We aren't told much about Samuel's inner thoughts about himself. His identity is defined by looking outward to his relationships, to the bigger story in which he finds himself, and to the transcendent God who knows him by name, calls him, leads him, and works for the good of others through his life. When you think about yourself, who, 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 are, who, who you are, how do you define yourself? What is most significant for you in thinking about your identity, who you are. We're introduced to other people in our gospel reading, Philip and his friend Nathaniel. Philip was evidently looking for someone promised in the long story of God to which he belonged because he told his friend Nathaniel, we found him about whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus, son of Joseph from Nazareth. Jesus was looking for Philip and called him to follow him in the story that would include learning and challenge, suffering and joy. Nathaniel wasn't so sure about Jesus when Philip invited him to come and see. But Jesus knew Nathaniel and his genuineness. He'd seen him sitting under the fig tree before Philip called him. Understanding that he was intimately known by Jesus already, Nathaniel recognised him as Rabbi, Son of God, King of Israel. And Jesus promised him that he'd see even more amazing things as heaven came down to earth in Jesus. What do we know about the identity of these two followers of Jesus, Philip and Nathaniel? They were people known by Jesus and called to follow him and learn from him as his disciples, which set them off on a journey that would change them forever. And as we prayed Psalm 139, looking upwards to God, I wonder if you were reminded of who you are, someone perfectly and intimately known and loved by God. With the psalmist, I'm amazed at God's care for me. It's wonderful to know that I'm known and loved completely. God knows everything about me, every action, every thought, every word, even before it's on my mouth, all my ways. And God is around me with his loving hand upon me. God leads me and holds on to me wherever I go. Even in the deepest darkness, God is there with me. We missed a few verses, so I'd like to read those to you. Verse six, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the grave, you're also there. If I spread out my wings towards the morning, or dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will cover me and the night will enclose me, the darkness is no darkness with you, but the night is as clear as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike. Even in the deepest darkness, whatever we go through, God is there with me. God sees me, God knows me, I'm not alone. God is with me in whatever situation I find myself. 
And God knew me even before I was born. God created every part of me in my mother's womb, the psalmist says. It's too much to comprehend, too wonderful for me to fathom. All I can do is stand in awe and praise God for his goodness towards me. God knows me and loves me as I am. And God's love is a love that changes me. We sometimes hear people saying, I am what I am. Meaning, that's the way I am, I'm not going to change. But Psalm 139 ends with a prayer for God to change me to be the person God wants me to be. When praying for the evil in the world to end, I also pray for myself. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Looking upward gives me confidence in my identity as one intimately known and loved by God who wants me to live in God's way, the way everlasting. I love this psalm, don't you? It's worth reading and pondering this psalm again and again. And then our reading from Paul's letter to the young church in Corinth reminds us of our identity by looking up to God and also urges change. Followers of Jesus needed to learn to abstain from the kind of sexual immorality which was accepted practice in Corinth. Because of who we are, says Paul, we're to live in a way which pleases the one to whom we belong. We are not our own. Our bodies, our whole being, belong to the Lord who wants to know us and work through us as fully physical human beings, both here and when our bodies are raised in the resurrection. As, G as God raised Jesus' body, we are confident that when Jesus returns, we will be raised to live with him. We believe in the resurrection of the body. So, shun fornication. The Greek word is porneia, which refers to any kind of sexual immorality. Paul wrote, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and that you are not your own? You were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body. Using the idea of the temple, where God chose to live with his people, Paul says that as a follower of Jesus, God himself lives in you by his spirit. We're not our own, we belong to God, and we've been bought at tremendous cost by the death of Jesus and need to learn to behave accordingly. Glorify God in your body. In other words, discover how to live the truly human life which brings glory to the God in whose image you're made and whose own unique image, his son Jesus, died to rescue you from all that will stop you being the person God longs for you to be. Be true to yourself. Is that really the best approach to a sense of identity, to a secure and joyful self-knowledge? The problem with be true to yourself is that it assumes that I have already I already have all the resources I need to succeed in life. I am perfect as I am. I just need to be positive and go and get what I want. What it forgets is our propensity for evil, our need to grow in knowledge, to be taught, to learn from our mistakes, and that the resources for those things actually come from outside ourselves. The former Archbishop of Canterbury, Rowan Williams, wrote, Without the transcendent, we shall soon find ourselves unable, sooner or later, to make any sense of the full range of human self-awareness. Looking up to God and understanding yourself to be intimately known and loved, called to share in God's story, embracing God's values, what better way to an authentic, stable, and satisfying sense of self, giving us a life that's worth living. 
one that can deal with, well with life's joys and sorrows, triumphs and disappointments, and responds well to injustice. Last Monday in Sydney, I attended the Thanksgiving service for the life of my friend Elizabeth. She visited here a few times when she was staying with me as we laid to rest her mortal body. Who was she? Where did she find her identity? Elizabeth was a daughter, a wife, a mother, a sister, an aunt, a grandmother, a friend, mine for 61 years, a worker, a follower of Jesus. Like all of us, Elizabeth wasn't perfect, she made mistakes, and she always wanted to learn and grow in following Jesus and play her part in God's big story. I used to send her the link to my sermons, which she appreciated and also gave me constructive feedback, how to do it better. As she faced her death through cancer, Elizabeth was confident of God's love for her and goodness towards her throughout her life. She knew that she was intimately and personally loved and known by, the, by God and would be fully embraced in his love when she went to be with the Lord. Who are you? Where do you find your identity? Is there any better way of understanding yourself than as a child of God, intimately and personally known by God, forgiven and called to follow in the way of Jesus, who loved you and gave himself for you? Let's pray. In the silence, maybe you can bring your own thoughts and prayers to God. Lord, may your word live in us and bear much fruit to your glory. Amen.